what I consider Lynch did the best at and what he got most right is he got the feel of a society that had no computers but had some sort of weird advanced technology. And and he, especially when you see the exp expanded versions with the additional scenes edited in, you even get to see more of that. Villain move didn't touch on it at all. I mean, it was ignored. It just was what it was. And for me, that part of the character development, not just the individual characters, but the reason for who these characters were and what they were portraying as a Mintat, as a Bene Gesserit, as a suit doctor or whatever, was ultimately important. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Vince Salerno Podcast. This is episode 80. I'm your host as always, Vince Salerno, and we are continuing my discussion with Steve Baker on the rise of Dune. Now, this installment gets more into um, comparisons between David Lynch's Dune and Denis Villeneuve's Dune. We get into Steve's thoughts on both movies, what he thinks each film got right, what each film got wrong, and of course my thoughts peppered in, um, but it's mostly um, a showcasing of Steve's vast, vast knowledge of the world of Dune and Frank Herbert. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about you guys. You, if you've seen part one, you guys know who Steve is, what he's doing. Um, he's in the fight of his life right now, so again, I will put... Um, Links in the description of where you guys can support him, where you can follow his work, because he needs your support and your prayers. So I, I encourage you all to keep him in your prayers as he continues going through uh, the fight of his life. Um, but again, we're not talking about that today. We're talking about uh, something that he uh, enjoys immensely and has a ton of passion for. Um, and I love seeing him in this happy state, talking about something that he really loves. So without further ado, here is The Rise of Dune, part two, featuring Steve Baker. You know that um, the other guy that was really interested in doing Dune um, was um, uh, Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott. Oh, really? Approached. Yeah, Ridley. I think that would you'll see Ridley Scott. I would love to have seen his his uh, version of that. Yeah. Um, I wonder how uh, <laughs> how much of the uh, influence of uh, Jodorowsky's Dune would have uh, played into that, just because uh, of the alien connection. <laughs> yeah, I, and and that may have been the connection. I don't remember, and I and I don't recall why he passed if it was because of Alien or because of Blade Runner, because that was all, you know, leading up to that time. But I do remember that he was approached about being involved with Dan. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Interesting. So, anyway, right. so Where do we uh, go? yeah, sorry. You were talking about um, the fact that the 84 film covers the, yeah. um, the war on technology, um, which led to, uh, the genetic, um, the, uh, the, I think you're, you're about to talk about the Benny Jesuit, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Essentially, neither movie really did a good job of explaining the Butlerian Jihad and humans, um, the fact that they had overthrown the artificial intelligence, the thinking machines, the robotics that they had become reliant upon for thousands of, you know, thousands upon thousands of years, 15,000 years. And so much so that, that the, that AI was overthrowing, um, was, you know, intent upon exterminating, exterminating humanity throughout the universe. And, um, and that, as I said, that was called the Butlerian Jihad or what Herbert called it. Mm -hmm. And the interesting, this is, now this is an interesting aspect about Herbert's genius 
is, remember, he published this story in book form in 65. How many people were thinking about artificial intelligence taking over, you know, and eliminating humanity? Right. And he, and he went, he went so much further than that in that not only was it essential for the survival of humanity to eliminate the thinking machines, computers, artificial intelligence, Uh it became illegal throughout the universe. So throughout the Dune Imperium, computers were illegal. I mean, like, uh, like it was, it was the, it was uh, uh, essentially a, a, you know, capital crime kind of thing. And, and so, and so that forced humanity into hyper development. So through breeding and through the great schools, they started developing the human mind and the body to do things that computers used to do for the humans. So, so the human computers then were the mintats. So, you know, um, uh, so you had, you had, uh, Thufer Howitt was the mintat for the, uh, house of Atreides. Uh-huh. And then you had Tyler DeVries was the mintat for Baron Harkonnen. Basically every great house had to buy literally purchase a mintat, a human computer. Um, and then, but the, but these human computers just didn't suddenly pop up. This was, this was 10,000 years worth of breeding and development and schooling and, uh, you know, plucking the right kid out that had the right characteristics and traits and then breeding them with others and until they, until they could do that. And then the same thing was happening in the Bene Gesserit school with their unique gifts and, and, powers it, it looked like that they had the ability to be truth sayers or truth you know to to basically read people's minds and be able to tell whether they were telling the truth or not mm-hmm. uh their ability to the voice their their way of battle the weirding way of battle which of course is one of the things that lynch didn't really want to get into trying explaining so he created a weirding module which doesn't exist in the book a lot of people a lot of people that saw that only knew Dune through Lynch's movie and then saw Villeneuve's movie were like going, Hey, where did the weirding modules go? Well, they, <laughs> they weren't in the book. <laughs> right. Um, so, so, uh, I, I think the fail. So when I, when I say the failure of both adaptations is neither one of them really adequately explained why, they these great schools existed. You know, what what is a Mintat? What is a soup doctor? What is a Bene Gesserit? What is the spacing guild? You know, uh all the way up until um, you know, even the, the schools that the that the master swordsman, you know, Duncan Idaho, um came from, who I by the way I named my son after was Duncan. Oh, and, that's you know why cool. I named, yeah, I named I named my son Duncan uh, because Duncan is the only oh I'm this is a spoiler spoiler alert spoiler alert at All this right. point if anyone hasn't seen either of the Dune movies I don't know what what they're doing here <laughs> yeah well this is a spoiler for people that have only seen the Dune movies um, so turn turn it off for thirty seconds and I'll I'll if you don't want to hear the spoiler alert. But Duncan um, is the only character that survives all six books. No, oh, you're kidding. You, I see. I just. <laughs> Wait a sec. Well, because d- d- didn't he die in, in, in book one? Yeah. Okay. He died in book one. He died in uh, Lynch's movie and he died in Villeneuve's movie. But he's the only character that is in all six books. Wow. Okay. Um so there you go. I should have had you turn this off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, so that's it. Show's over. <laughs> All right, so I won't. I won't tell you. I won't tell you why or how. Okay. Or what Fascinating. Is. Cool. So, so that's why I named my son Duncan. Um, and then, and then, uh, you know. So, all right. So, going back to the original question, is what I, what I, what I consider Lynch did the best at, and what he got most right is he got the feel 
of a society that had no computers but had some sort of weird advanced technology and and he especially when you see the ex- expanded versions with the additional scenes edited in you even get to see more of that mm-hmm. um uh and Villeneuve didn't touch on it at all i mean it was ignored it just right. was what it was and for me that part of the character development, not just the individual characters, but the reason for who these characters were and what they were portraying as a Mentat, as a Bene Gesserit, as a suit doctor or whatever, was ultimately important. And and ultimately important to the story because in the Bene Gesserit breeding program, which ultimately produced the Quitsat Sidorak, Paul Moadib, Atreides, Usul, <laughs> whatever name you give him, what what uh what ultimately produced him was a you know th- a breeding program that ex- extended over thousands of years, thousands of years, um, of genetic breeding manipulation by the Bene Gesserit sisterhood to ultimately culminate into that person who was all of the above. He could see through time like the Spacing Guild, he himself was a human mentat without having to go through the school. Mm -hmm. And he had the training of his mother, uh, Jessica, who was a Bene Gesserit, to train him also in the voice and in all that. And then he, because he was the Quetzal's Hatterach, then was the one that was able to see that, which even the, the Reverend Mothers couldn't look into that place. And so, uh, but none of that, th- this, you know, you notice there's, there's no aliens in Dune. You know, there's no, there's no Star Wars, you know, bar room scene, you know, with all the different uh, alien characters. Mm-hmm. There, the, Dune is the story of humanity. It, humanity's expansion into the universe and then how they had to deal with that without technology. So in other words, how human kind mind physically, philosophically, religion, ecologically, all the above developed over thousands of years without the aid of computers. And that was really the the prescient genius of Frank Herbert was to take those stories that way. Now, as they said, that is probably the fundamentally overriding reason why most people thought Dune could never be adequately adapted to the big screen. Um, I still feel that way now after, after Villeneuve. I still uh, am disappointed. So I yeah, hate to jump around. Me, um, one of our co- on conversations, you told me that you, you actually think it would have, the story of Dune would be better served as a Game of Thrones style uh, television series and, and using multiple seasons to cover um yeah book one and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, hearing, hearing the detail that, um, that ha- really has gone into the world. Um, I, I kind of agree. Like it would, I think it would be, um, to, to fit all that lore and to accurately, um, portray even the, um, the internal thoughts, um, uh, that the book so, uh, beautifully, lays out uh from the main from the characters um it uh yeah I, i'm curious what what a, what a series would look like especially now that we have it ingrained in our heads twice now what a movie version of this would look like you, well and we we have the sci-fi miniseries as well and then oh, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this or not but legendary as a studio has greenlit a a, a um adaptation not it was an adaptation of brian herbert's uh book on the the bene Gesserit sisterhood so the sons uh, doing prophecy was, right yeah prophecy so that goes back ten thousand years before dune okay so this is this is at the end of the butlerian jihad and this is the story of the development of the you know basically the bene Gesserit, which is one of the you know one of the great schools and and their their influence over humanity. 
which brings me to my, to my other criticism of, of Villeneuve. Or my, actually, I, I would say this is my main criticism of Villeneuve. Mm-hmm. You can, you can, you can, I can, I could nitpick both movies to death, but I do understand what an adaptation is. I do understand the limitations of an adaptation. So whoever's going to throw that accusation out at me right now, you know, so it's, 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 it's not true. I have a problem and I'll explain why. One of the problems I have with Villeneuve is he felt like that he needed to change a couple of primary characters in ways that I think were totally unnecessary. All right. The first one was turning Leah Kynes into a woman. All right. Uh-huh. Leah Kynes was the, um, uh, the Imperial, the Imperium's planetary ecologist over Dune. He worked directly for the Padasha emperor. He did not work, but he had, he had, um, if you follow more of the story, I don't, I, I don't think you get this from book one. I think this is uh, later on, but he was, um, his father, uh, so Leot Kynes, I'm trying to remember his father's name. I, I'm, I'm spacing. Um, oh yeah. Uh, oh gosh. It's in the book. Yeah. I'm, I'm spacing out on his father's name. But anyway, so his father, he basically inherited the job from his father. And, and, um, but they were not born as Fremen. They had become Fremen, uh-huh. even though they worked for the, um, the Imperium. Basically, he was a double agent, you know, uh, between the Fremen and the Imperium. And, and so what was completely unnecessary for Villeneuve was taking that relation or that that character and turning it into a woman the only reason that makes any sense whatsoever is the worst of all reasons and that is to give a woman another prominent role in his movie you know this is a this is wokeism dei blah 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 which is so prevalent in hollywood today uh-huh. did it hurt the movie no, it was unnecessary because some of the most powerful characters in the Dune universe are women. And ultimately, if you stick with the books, they are the most powerful characters in the universe. All right. right? Yeah. The, 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 and especially, and I think this is this is why Legendary has decided to tell the story of the sisterhood of the Bene Gesserit through Dune Prophecy in a, a new series, because that's really ultimately where... They ultimately they manipulate everything that's going on in with humanity mm-hmm. for you know the remainder of time. And and so it was com- a completely unnecessary character manipulation to do that, to turn kinds into that. But he also then eliminated the book fact that Leah Kynes, the male <laughs> uh, book version was the father of Chani or Chaney, depending upon which pronunciation you adhere to. Yeah, yeah. And so they that was that relationship was eliminated in the Villeneuve movie. Mm-hmm. That that were that was kept intact in the in the Lynch version. But by eliminating that in the Villeneuve version adaptation, now you fast forward to Cheney becoming a petulant little, you know, bitch, <laughs> for lack of a better way of saying it, at the end of the movie, which never happened in the book. Mm-hmm. And um, and again, the reason why it's unnecessary. Okay, so if you listen to why Villeneuve did that, he said that he's setting up the third movie, which is essentially the Dune Messiah story, and essentially because. Paul's got to become a flawed character. Up to this point, in both the Lynch adaptation and the Villeneuve adapt- adaptation, Paul is nearly um, deity. You know, he's being, he's becoming more and more powerful. He's becoming, uh, uh, you know, more omniscient. And and essentially, in Lynch's final cut, they they elevated Paul to actual 
deity status. Mm -hmm. He's a Gary right? Stu or a Gary Stu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's what happened. Uh, and so Lynch did not have the expectation that he would continue on with, you know, the Dune universe. So he just ended the story. And that's fine. All right. See that? I Even though I didn't like it, because at the end of the Lynch movie, all of a sudden it's raining on Dune, which if you knew anything about the book, that would kill all the worms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you destroy the ecology of Dune in an instant, and, and and the whole idea of the spice must flow. Well, no, you just killed the spice because the producers of the spice are the worms, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you just you just he literally he literally turned Paul into a god. Lynch did at the end of the movie, and in so doing, destroyed the universe, space travel. Um, by the way, all these people that are addicted to, to spice, without it, they will die. Mm -hmm. Their addiction, they will die. So everybody in the universe addicted to spice is going to die. That's what that's essentially the net result of Lynch's ending. But because you didn't tell all those other pieces of the story, you don't know that if you just went to the movie. So it was fine. Right. I mean, there's your adaptation. He, he tied it up in a neat bow and he ended the thing. Villeneuve knew or wanted to or hoped that he would get to take on the next book, Dune Messiah, where they begin to show that um, power does corrupt, right? And, um, and so what ultimately happened in his adaptation is he turned Chani or Chaney into... Uh, the mechanism whereby he would start introducing that because she became Paul's critic there that he was using religious, you know, mechanisms to manipulate the Fremen, manipulate the population to his desires, uh -huh. ultimately manipulating the population to war, which of course religion has been done. Now, this is a big theme in the book, but, but Herbert didn't use Cheney to do that. He used the Bene Gesserit. Yeah. And so I, it was, this is what I'm saying. It was unnecessary for him to turn Cheney against Paul because in the book, they're in love. You know, she, this is a, this is another thing that he did. By the end of the book, Cheney had already given birth to a son. So Paul and Paul and, uh, and Cheney were, were teenage lovers. They had already had a child. Mm -hmm. um, by the time he's 18 years old, he's a father and she's a mother. And, uh, and sorry for anybody that hasn't read the book yet, but before the final battle in the book and the, um, uh, the emperor's Sardaukar elite, you know, stormtroopers had raided the, uh, Fremen siege where Cheney was and they killed Paul's son. They killed their son in the book. Hmm. So there's a lot more drama in the book than, you know, made it to either version of the movie. Yeah. But the point being is, is that, is that he didn't, Villeneuve did not need Cheney to become what she became at the end of the book because had the mother, you had the Reverend mothers, you had the, you know, you had, you had, um, uh, Princess Irulan, all of these were, trained Bene Gesserit. Mm -hmm. they, the, and in the book, they were the ones openly talking about manipulating cultures through not just genetic, you know, breeding uh, programs, but also through their Missionaria Protectiva, which was their missionaries that would go throughout the universe and, and, and um, insinuate themselves into other cultures and then start dropping their own mythos, their own legends, their own stories, so that when hundreds or thousands of years later, another Bene Gesserit would come and enter that culture, they could take advantage of the religious myth that they had dropped into and seeded that planet or that culture with. Mm -hmm. Which exactly Paul, what the inclusion of Paul becoming the... Uh the Lisa Nagaib, like just totally upends everything they had planned. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Well, it, 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 
not only, but see the, the Lisa al Gaib, the legend of that was, was insinuated into the Fremen culture hundreds, maybe thousands of years before by the Bene Gesserit themselves. They had already established that. They had already established that prophecy, that prophecy into the culture, so that if they ever came into the culture themselves for whatever other reason, they could take advantage of that. So it was our, it was already established, and I, and I don't I don't think they, I don't think Villeneuve needed Cheney to do that, and it really rips out what I thought was the just the masterpiece conclusion of the of the book to begin with, because ultimately this is a medieval. Um, Imperium. You have the great houses. You have the you know the 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 Chom Company Enterprise. You have the Lounsrod. All of these, all of these inter, um, all these characters, uh, characteristics of government and econ an economy that rules the the universe. Also, then manipulated by the great houses. You have the power of 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 the spacing guild because basically there is no trade in the universe without spacing guild. And so you can't piss them off. You know, they can, they can just deny you access to moving your product from one planet or one system to another. And then you have, um, ultimately you have obviously the spice, the most valuable substance in the universe and which facilitates it and puts all of these great schools on hyperdrive without the spice. They're not able to accomplish what they were able to accomplish without it. And then, and then, Ultimately, when you're when you're looking at what happened there towards the end of the book, you realize from a political standpoint why Paul looks at Princess Irulan after he banishes her father, the Padishah Emperor, to um, Seleucus Secundus, his prison planet, where he trains the the Sardaukar. So he banishes, he tells him he's going to be banished there, and that's where he's going to serve out the rest of his life. He's going to sit on a throne, you know, on Seleucus Secundus. And then he looks at, at Irulan and he said, and you're going to be my wife, but you're never going to share my bed. You're never going to feel my touch. You're never going to feel the gentleness of love. You're never going to bear a child by me. That belongs to Chani. Yeah. But marriage, but the marriage was a political marriage to take the for him to take the throne mm -hmm. not, not to become god right so if he was god he didn't need that which is ultimately in the first cut or the original cut of dune that's what what lynch was left with he was left with only turning paul into god the politics was over yeah that's why that's why they did not address that at the end but in alternate cuts fan cuts uh where people that have acquired the additional footage that lynch shot you can actually see that very powerful very touching moment at the end of the book and it's it's verbatim in in lynch's movie where paul walks up to you know he walks up to Elon and tells her that you're going to be my wife and it's a political marriage, et cetera, et cetera. And then he walks over to Chani. He said, but don't worry. She's never going to share my bed. She's never going to feel my touch. Mm -hmm. that, you know, she's never going to bear my children. That's yours. That part of me belongs to you. And then Paul's mother, Jessica, moves over to Chana, Chani and whispers in her ear and says, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the quote, I, I hate getting the quote wrong, but basically says, you know, even even though we bear the name of concubine because Jessica was the concubine unmarried of Paul's father, the Duke Leda. Mm -hmm. right? And he never, he never married her because he had to keep his position open as Duke for the potential of a political marriage, maybe to ascend to the throne. Right. And he never married Jessica, which he laments in the book. Mm -hmm. And then Paul's in the same situation and Jessica goes over to Chani and says, they will call us concubines, but history will call us wives, you know, and that's not an exact quote, but that's how the book ends. Mm -hmm. And it's a very powerful and poignant ending. And it shows again, how powerful the women are in the story. And what Villeneuve did was so absolutely unimportant and 
uh, in my mind, unnecessary in my mind. So when, yeah. you, when you talk about what when you talk about what the two versions got right, what they didn't get right, I felt, and this is a this is an over you know just a high level um, thirty thousand foot view. I felt like that Lynch got the feel better. He also the other thing that Lynch did better is he got um, he and this is this is going to sound like a a real slap in the face of Villeneuve, but I'm going to tell you what I like about Villeneuve in a moment. But Lynch didn't allow his script to talk down to the viewer. Lynch was more adherent to the original dialogue in the book, more often using verbatim quotes and and Herbert's prose is beautiful it's i mean it's, uh, he's he's not just a science fiction imaginary imaginary guy he is a incredible writer and his prose is gorgeous it's complicated it's beautiful it's it's intelligent and villeneuve went the other route and he modernized it to his like you know TikTok chats between Johnny and Paul or whatever, you know, it, it, you know, or, or between Duncan and, and Paul, you know, the, the ribbing and the joking and the kind of things that they did. Um, it, it, I, I felt like that Villeneuve instead, I'm not saying he insulted the intelligence of his audience, but he definitely irrefutably dumbed it down. He dumbed Herbert's prose down. <laughs> probably for the stupid dumbass audiences we have today. That's all I can say <laughs> for the wokeism that we have today. I, and I, and I, I don't think that he, I don't think that Villeneuve went total woke over, you know, I, I, like I said, I've already criticized uh, him changing uh, Lee, Dr. Leah Kynes uh, to a woman, which again was not necessary. Um, uh, the women of the women of the Fremen were just as fierce and just as, uh, um, lethal a fighter as the men were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he could have showed that. I mean, he didn't. the The other thing now, now we if we talk about the characters between the two, the two movies, let's uh, let, let, let's compare the two Pauls just real quick. I mean, you have to you have to start at the top, right? Yeah, so you take the main character. All right, so Kyle McLaughlin as Paul. What what Lynch got wrong is that. Kyle was too old for that role. But what he got right with Kyle is Kyle actually grew into Moadib. I thought he effectively grew into Moadib. What Villeneuve did in getting it right and getting Paul right is he got a, you know, very petite, small young man with the right hair. Everything was, everything was right. He could make him young. He could make him believably 15 years old. Um, uh, Timothy Shelley May, he can make him believable as a 15 year old because he has that appearance, right? The problem was, is that Timothy Shelley May never grew into Moadib. Uh -huh. I bought, I bought him as Paul Atreides and the Gam Jabbar and the training of his mother and the training from, you know, Gurney Halleck and all of that. I bought into that and I was excited. And by the way, when, when, when it was announced that um, Chalamet was going to be Paul, uh, I was excited about that choice. I just don't think that they grew him into the role of Moadi. Whereas I think of the exact opposite of the other. So that's my, Again, my opinion. Flame me if you want in the comments, but that's my opinion between the two. Um, I thought Chani, I thought uh, certainly Lou's selection of Chani um, was much better than Lynch's selection of Sean Young. Cause, because descriptively in the book, Herbert described Chani as being elfin in character. It said it several times. Her elfin face, her elfin characteristics. And, um, um, ah, what's her name? Zendaya. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she, I mean, she was perfect. Mm -hmm. She was perfect. 
I, I have no criticisms about her acting. I have critic. The only criticism that I have about her character is what she was given as a script, and that's not her fault. Yeah, it's not, thought, not not Zendaya's work. It's it's what she was given. That's right. That's right. No, I I, I thought she was I thought she was perfect for the role as well. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, the, you know, I, I have like I said, I have I have nitpicking criticisms about virtually every character. Um, I absolutely loved the portrayal of the Baron and you know Baron Harkonnen uh, by Villeneuve. Well, well, let me tell you. Okay, look, I should go back to the thirty thousand foot level on on Villeneuve. What what Villeneuve got right, right was it's big and it's incredible. The cinematography, the music, all of this. I do have a little bit of a criticism about the music in the second movie uh, over the first. By the time we got to the second, I thought they were just relying upon bombastic rather than the subtlety in the first movie. In the first movie, you could hear the textures were so much more. There was so much more variety in the uh, the soundtrack uh, by Hans Zimmer in the first movie, whereas the second movie, I know the second movie was the battle scenes and it was the war and it was the you know there was so much fighting going on that, but you know. You you just felt like you were rumbling in your seat the whole time in the IMAX theater uh, in the in the second movie where you got you got a lot more um, uh, relief from that with the subtleties of the sounds and the textures of the of the soundtrack in the first uh, Villeneuve movie. But um, but then of course then we have the issue of the um, uh, of the soundtrack to Lynch's movie, which I am really stunned by this is because a lot of people that I'm reading in the message boards like the soundtrack to Lynch's version better than the Hans Zimmer version. Mm -hmm. You know who did the soundtrack to Lynch's version was Toto. Mm -hmm. The band. The same band that did Africa, Hold the Line, Rosanna. They did the soundtrack. There was only one song that they didn't do, um, and it was the Prophecy theme by Brian Eno. And they, but they still contributed to that. They were it was basically co-written by them. A lot of people think Eno did the whole soundtrack, and that's not true. It was the he did he contributed to one one track on the soundtrack. But Toto, the band, the you know studio musicians that they are, they did that theme. So just so happens that Toto, by pure coincidence, is my favorite band of all time. And <laughs> and, and, that, and that's a to, that's a hundred percent coincidence. Um, uh, I actually told that story to Steve Lukather, the uh, founding member of Toto, uh, their guitarist. Um, I actually told him that story about how I named my son Dune uh, after Duncan um, in Dune. And uh, he was like, you're kidding me. I said, no, I'm, I'm dead serious. And uh, and that was and I explained to him there was no connection between my love for Toto and my love for Dune. It just happened to be that weird intersection between the two. Mm -hmm. But um no, I, I, there's, there's Villeneuve's, Villeneuve's obviously so, had so much far advanced technology. You know, he had almost 40 years uh, better technology to work with in constructing, you know, the, what we saw on the screen and, and he took advantage of it. And it's, it was a, you know, it's a, if I, if I knew nothing about the story and this is what I ask people, I ask, you know, all the time. Did you read the book or did you not read the book? Okay. If you read the book, I mean, sorry, if you didn't read the book, do you feel like that you got a payoff from the two movies? And almost invariably, the answer is yes. And they think that it was set up well for the next, because, you know, there, it was, there's, it's a little miniature cliffhanger with, you know, Chani storming off, you know, at the end. Um, so it's it's obviously setting up a third part, which is the second book, and uh, and so people generally that did not read the book feel good about it. Then you have the people that read the book and were just amazed at the cinematography and the presentation, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm totally fine with the adaptation." Yeah, it's, you know, you got to know what an adaptation is. And there's you got that group, and then you've got people that like me that are more critical simply because I've been immersed in it so many for so long, and I've read the book ten times, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and 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 so uh, 
I, I just, I just wish I could have been a consultant on the script. Let's just say that my, you know, my, my, you know, not that I know anybody involved because I certainly don't, but, uh, if I could have been a, if I could have been a consultant on the script, I would have advised Villeneuve of the complete unnecessary aspect of the change of Dr. Liet Kynes. I would have absolutely said you could set this problem up that Chani was used to set up for the third movie by using the existing problem as it was served up to you on a silver platter by Herbert himself in his characters, which were the Bene Gesserit sisterhood, you know? Um, and, and, and then eliminated that, uh, that controversy. So that's, you know, that's, that's it. Uh, uh, I mean, like I said, I could, I could nick, I could nitpick both of them to death, but that's not what you do if, when you understand it's an adaptation. But <laughs> let's go back to the, the 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 Game of Thrones treatment. This is an actual fantasy of mine I've had for twenty years. Is that if if I and I would do this, I, I swear, I lo- I love I love that universe so much that if I were a billionaire, I would take whatever sex you know slice of my wealth was required i would go to the estate you know the herbert estate who grants the permissions for all of these things you know for all the film and book and comic and game and tv adaptations i would say i'm going to fund this myself but here's what i want i want a unabridged series. And when I say unabridged, I mean literally replicate all the dialogue from Herbert's book. And I would pay for it. And then whatever I made back would be fine. You know, if it was, a, if it was profitable, I would expect to receive a return on it. But I would take the risk away from the theater, or I mean, from the, uh, um, the, the um, filmmakers, I would take the risk away from the uh, uh, the studio. There would be no investment risk whatsoever. This is something I would take the entire risk on just to deliver visually at the same level of whether we're talking about Game of Thrones or Villeneuve or an, a, a combination of Lynch and that, whatever, but basically an unabridged version with all the dialogue, all the thoughts. Oh, that was the other thing that uh, Lynch got right. As you know, he had... The, you got to hear their thoughts in his movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that was a device that Herbert used in the book. Herbert actually allowed you, and you know, in italics, you could see their thoughts. And Villeneuve did not do it, but that helps fill in the story without you having to go and do long explanations. So you don't you don't have to create two paragraphs of additional writing because again, like you said, you're already depending upon which vert which edition of the book you got you've got 650 to 800 pages already you know and and that easily becomes a 1200 page book which is by and large inex- inaccessible to most people at that point so you got a you got a 1200 page book if he has to explain why they're doing it instead he herbert used the device of us seeing the thoughts of the main characters and then Lynch adapted that. He got that part right. Uh-huh. Lynch got a lot right. Got a lot wrong. He did, you know, like I said, he turned he turned Paul into a deity. He created this weird thing called the weirding modules um, because he didn't want to get into the fight. Uh, the how to do maybe just technologically he couldn't figure. He didn't felt like it was just not worth the worth the effort of trying to do that. But again, that's an adaptation thing, a device that I can I can live with. And the one thing, and then of course we haven't even talked about the sci-fi miniseries. There was actually two miniseries. They actually did the Dune story in six hours. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about that and your thoughts on yeah. that. They did do well, obviously with a much lower budget. Um, it because they because they they had six hours to burn. They were much more. They followed the book much better than either Lynch or Villeneuve. Again. Less of a 
less of the constricture of having to do a two or three hour adaptation. So they had six hours. Uh, they followed the book much better. Absolutely, some of the most ridiculous costuming I've ever seen in my life. Some of the you know the the low budget TV stuff was a little bit over the top. Um, there were uh, there were some there were some not good actors involved, and there were some really important actors, like famous actors that I just thought mailed it in and didn't do a great job with you know the role. I, I, maybe they weren't getting paid enough and. I don't I, I don't know. But but a lot but again if you go to these message boards there are there is a large faction of people out there um that whether it's on you know whether it's on websites or social media or news groups or whatever that like the mini series better than they like either movie. Mm. And uh, I'm not I'm not one of those people, but I will tell you this is that I loved the second mini series which was called Children of Doom, which was essentially the combination of Doom Messiah and Children of Doom, those two books in one miniseries. And I thought that was excellent. I thought it was very, very well done. Uh, there was a new director in charge. Um, they replaced a couple of characters. Uh, the actors weren't available. Um, and it had the same problem. Uh, with uh, some actors seem to be mailing it in. Like uh, Susan Sarandon was in the uh, second series, and I, I've always respected her as an actor. I thought she was absolutely horrible. I thought she was just, I mean, it was like it was like um, high school drama team uh, level acting that she brought to the screen. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. And, and I was, and, but, but overall, uh, I thought, I thought they did a great job with the, with Children of Dune miniseries. On sci-fi, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but 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 going back to the whole Game of Thrones treatment, if I could do it, if I could afford it, if I could pay for it, and I could take the risk away from the filmmakers and from the studio and everybody else, I would certainly. I would, that would be my fantasy in life would be to just fund a complete unabridged recreation of the book, top to bottom, that regardless of cool. how many episodes it took. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that would be a um, that would that would be an adaptation I think worth worth looking into. I mean, you know, right now like the franchise has been repopularized for the next ten years, so it may be mm -hmm. something that could happen. Uh, you know, twenty thirty years down the road when the franchise needs another facelift. Um, yeah, I, you know, we talked about this before. Your thoughts on the ending, and um, it's funny um, when I walked out of the theater. I had two split reactions. I was very divided on the ending um, in part because of what you mentioned, how the movie chooses to portray Chani as a, um, instead of, you know, the uh, being um, by Paul's side through the whole thing. Um, they, they make her basically like an agnostic or an atheist or, or borderline atheist. And, 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 uh, divide like the northern and the southern tribes of the Fremen and the, and the southern tribes where Stilgar comes from are the ones that believe fully in the prophecy of the Lisa Nagaib um, and Shani comes from the north where they don't subscribe to that um, but I, I, my first takeaway was wow this kind of has the, the Paul ascending but losing the one thing that grounded him which was Shani um, it kind of rings to like the Godfather. I'm a huge fan of the Godfather. It's one of my favorite movies, um, favorite trilogies. And it definitely felt like Villeneuve was trying to make Paul the Michael Corleone of, of science fiction, which it, 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 then like a month later, he came out and said that quote, like, yeah, I was, I was doing that. And uh, <laughs> it felt good to, to be validated in that. And that's what I liked about the ending. But another side of me felt like, well, yeah, that very intimate and profound moment um, was stripped away. Uh, and, and you make Chani, um, again, like, you know, stuck in her ways and unwilling to, um, like, you know, she loves Paul, but she can't get behind um, winning the war against the Harkonnens in this particular way, which was a little jarring throughout the film. I was like, Chani's not not 
you know, in the book, she's not uh, um, getting up and, and yelling, this prophecy is how they enslave us. And, you know, that, that's not her character. And I, I watched several interviews before, uh, of, of Villeneuve before, before we were preparing to do this. And every single one, he says, Frank Herbert was disappointed by the reception of the first book because he thought people, because people were taking Paul to be a hero. And then he wrote Messiah as a um, response and a course correction to that. And he said his approach to part two was, and to, to, to both movies was not to pay, to be faithful to the book, but to be faithful to Herbert's original vision. And uh, I, I find that answer to be very um, jarring because well, he wrote the book, the first book as the first book regardless of how it was interpreted. And I, I think you, I think you may have said to me that he, he that was, um, that was, you know, that wasn't necessarily the full focus and intention of the ending of part one. They didn't want, he didn't want that people to necessarily see Paul as a cautionary tale. And Messiah was a furthering of the story and, and, and um, fully subscribing to, okay, this Paul who has now full power um, is a cautionary tale. Is that, am I, am I reading that right? Yeah. And, and I see, this is something I meant to do and forgot to do it before we had this discussion was to go look this claim up that Villeneuve makes. I've heard him make that claim that Herbert himself expressed disappointment in the way the book fans perceived Paul Moadib at the end of the first book. Yeah. I've read um, biographies on Herbert, including the one that his son wrote. I've read commentaries by Herbert on his own writing. If I've ever read that over the last 30 something years, I don't remember that. And I, and, and Villeneuve does in fact refer to that often enough. I want to go back. I, I, and, and look, I've read so much, you know, and forgot, I've, I've forgotten more than I, you know, than I remember. So he, it, this could have been something that he revealed in his son's biography. Mm -hmm. about him and i just don't remember it. um so i need to go back and find what the source on that before i criticize villeneuve on it i'm not i'm not saying he's a liar or they made it up he obviously believes it he heard it from somewhere uh because he's publicly stating it and in this world of google we can all look that stuff up and find out what the source is so I, i'm sure he must herbert must have said it but he did he did just fine dismantling Paul in the second book without setting it up in the first book. He didn't need to, you know. Right. The, the, yeah, pro yeah. the problem with the, the problem with people between book one and book two is book two is not book one. I mean it is it is jarring. It is uh his his even his storytelling devices change severely. He goes much deeper into using dialogue as a way of becoming preachy in his philosophies about the world, about the way the world should be, about the way the world is, about uh, uh, philosophy, politics, religion. He uses the dialogues between the primary characters and extended, you know, long diatribes that just turn a lot of people off. There's not nearly as much action as they finished up the, you know, the first book with. Mm -hmm. And it's so dialogue heavy that it just turned a lot of people off. But I will tell you, if you read it once and then come back to it and then read it the second time, then Messiah blossoms. Because that's the experience I had. And that's all I've also heard that from other people is suddenly you go, oh, now I understand what he's doing. I understand where he's going. And this is important. And it becomes a very, very important book at that point. Far more important than the than the than the casual fan understands it to be. Hmm. Yeah, it almost feels like the new was most people, off by it. most people are just they they're done. They get they they start reading Messiah and they're done. They never read the rest of the books. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah, it it almost feels like Villeneuve was a bigger fan of Messiah than he was the first book because 
It's like it, it, it's like his goal was to get to Messiah, um, and everything he did in in part in Dune and Dune Part Two was to set up Messiah. But again, like you said, Dune did a great job of telling its story independent of any sequel or continuation, whether or not uh, Herbert intended to continue the story or not, which obviously he did. And if 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 Messiah is the response to that, then let Messiah speak for itself as far as Paul's downfall. But yeah. um, and and you can even you know hint at some some you know something's not right at the end of, of the movie without sacrificing uh, Chani and Paul because it 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 really I mean the, in the movie they switch the the interactions where Paul says like I want you to know that. In the movie, Paul says to Chani, "I want you to know that I, I love you and I, I'm I'm faithful to you." And then he tells the princess Suloran, "You're going to be my wife." And then it comes off as, "What am I to you now?" Yeah. You, you like, yeah. and that's that's not how it is in the book. And then in the book, obviously, it's it's the opposite, where he tells the princess first and then goes to Chani, like, "But you, you know, where my passion, my love, my desire, my heart is you." And yeah. It just, it's just so, uh, it, like, I, I think Villeneuve's justification is, is, is not justified because it just comes off as a, we have to get to Messiah. We have to get to Messiah. It's like, okay, but you just, you just perverted a pivotal part of Herbert's vision, regardless of whether he intended it or not. People like that ending and that ending speaks to people. I mean, you especially for, for a reason. And to take that that moment out, and I feel like that could have been a all time great iconic final scene if Velnuve chose to do it. Because I, you know, I think you and I can both agree Velnuve's up to the task. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah just I, 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 I have again my two trains of thoughts are I like it because it's 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 Paul becoming the uh, the the Michael Corleone of science fiction. Which in concept I love, but also as a fan of the book, um, yeah, it just feels like a very jarring portrayal of uh, of what Frank Herbert had intended um, in a, in an effort to just get to Messiah. Yeah, and and I and I you know I, I can I can beat this horse <laughs> just to death three or four times talking about it, and I I totally agree with something you said, and I've never considered. Villeneuve a woke filmmaker he's never I mean I mean look I, I don't I don't pick that up from his Blade Runner you know oh sequel. yeah I don't, no, absolutely I don't pick it up from Arrival I don't pick it up from Sicario I don't pick it up from any of his other movies at all I don't I don't see him as a woke-ish filmmaker that he's and and, and that's why I don't understand the Leah Kynes character um <clears throat> flip I don't understand why he did this what you what you described about essentially they divided the fremen into two you know like the southern the southern were the fundamentalists right mm -hmm. you know and the northern ones were the ones that were more uh a skeptical of the Bene Gesserit legend of Lisan al Gaig. and and um and in the book the desert people were unified it was the city dwelling fremen that were different but even then towards the end when they realized that they were going to need the, the the city dwellers on their side there's discussion in the book even from Stilgar we'll be able to bring them back you know we'll be able to bring them over it won't take they're they're fremen still it's in their blood we'll be able to train them in in the ways of of um, of the desert people and and uh and that was the only division in the book was just the city dwelling fremen and the desert dwelling fremen Mm -hmm. Not in the north and the south, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which, yeah, like that's that's almost suspicious. So I say all that to say I hope to God that Villeneuve is not going that way in book three to where he creates, as you said, this is a battle between the atheist and the believers. Yeah, he agnostic. did say in multiple interviews that I watched, he said he references um, that like growing up. You know, like the Catholic Church was in, uh, had political power over the government, um, and uh, that you know he wasn't a fan of that, and that like that influence and that that upbringing um, is part of you know why he does what he does in in the book. 
which look, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic. I'm not going to say the Catholic church has been perfect, um, for throughout history. Um, the only version of, of the church that is perfected is the one in heaven. Um, and that, that never changes, never is corrupted. But, um, I don't know, to have that like influence of like, Oh, almost like, yeah, religion is bad. Religion can be used to influence myth can be turned into religion, which can be turned into influence, um, of, um, of, uh, you know, people who are, are easily, are easily influenced. And so it, I don't know, it, it, to me, it almost, um, degrades characters like Stilgar because Stilgar is, is portrayed as a, um, passionate, believer in in the Lisan al gaib and everything and it, it, i know it's like the movie wants me to think stilgar is almost pathetic in his his fidelity towards paul but in the book it's almost I, in the book i i, I want to feel like stilgar has become like a, a an adopted father to paul so i don't know if, if my reading's off on that based on the book but that's just that's just my my findings when yeah. when comparing the two yeah, no, that I mean, a Stilgar is ultimately important. I'm no more, no more. I'm not going to give any more um, uh, spoilers, but I mean, Stilgar remains important to Paul, and going forward in the next, you know, the next two books, he's a he's a very very important character, uh, and ultimately important to Paul and his family, and the the direction of Paul's growing empire at that point. But it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's an insinuation in the movie for sure that he's just a blind zealot. I got that from Villeneuve. Um, and, you know, I'll accept anything kind of that, that fundamentalist zealot. And I didn't get that. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is, is that in the book, the Fremen are zealots, <laughs> period, you know, there's some skepticism around the edges, uh, but I mean, you know, obviously, and Villeneuve portrayed this in the book, and Lynch left it out was when he um, had the first knife fight where he had to kill um, uh, uh, Jamis, right? Jamis, yeah, Jamis, Jamis. So, so when he had to kill him, um, that was that was because Jamis was skeptical and didn't believe. Mm -hmm. So it's already there, and uh, uh, it was worth. Well, it may not be worth it, but I'll throw it out there anyway because it's one. It's one of my other criticisms of the uh, Villeneuve portrayal of the Fremen. Is the Fremen were in fact crazy multicultural in his book? Mm -hmm. Every skin tone: white, dark black, browns, every shade very 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 multicultural people that would not have been the case in real life uh, people that had lived on a desert planet in the inbreeding between themselves for thousands of years would have been a brown race and um and because chani was the daughter of layet who was the son? I'm going to remember his first Pardo Kinds. Pardo Kinds. Is it right? Did I get it right? I think I so. Think it, I, think, I wish I, I think knew the camera. Otherwise, I could look at yeah, it right yeah. now. Uh, you, you could look. You could probably Google it. Uh, look, Google Leet Kinds' father. I think it's Pardo Kinds. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll 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 look that up. You keep going. So, um, they would have had coming maybe, and, and it's not. I don't I don't recall that it's absolutely described, but they might have had an off-world, more off-world appearance, but still her mother was Fremen. So she would have been brown as well. And that's why I thought that Zendaya was a good, was a good um, actress choice. And, uh, and, and so, but I would say that that was an aspect. Now, Lynch wasn't perfect in this, but most of the Fremen in the Lynch film were extras from source and they, they shot in Mexico. Mm. So if you look at the, all the extras, they were Mexicans. They were, they were, they were Brown people. 
and of course, it, the, the 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 Fremen are descended from um, the Fremen are descended from basically the Sinzuni Arabic wanderers anyway. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the, in terms of their descent from original, you know, Earth, uh, that's that's who they were. The Atreides were basically descendants of Greeks, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and so you had those different different bloodlines uh that you could fast forward and look and see how how they how they uh, evolved over 25,000 years but i believe i believe that an act, if you were actually going to be accurate in the trail of the fremen they would have been a brown to dark brown people mm -hmm. but they would have been unicolor they would not have been they would not have been widely diverse because i mean certainly there's some genetic um skipping and things that happen with with melanin you know but the, but the but the rea but the reality is is that they would have been largely a very brown people mm -hmm. uh after thousands of years in the desert on a planet you know well yeah i mean yeah there, i think yeah we both have established there's a lot the both movies i think get wrong and, and specifically focusing on villeneuve's take on the series um there is still um a lot to be uh praised and like you you pointed out that chan like yeah zendaya great casting um i think she was really good um as shawnee and you know i used to be someone who did not like timothy chalamet at all as an actor i thought like this guy's dressing up in women's clothes he's comes off very <laughs> feminine and, and and just like not very masculine and um like over the course of the past two three years between the two dune films um, and even even the Wonka movie he did, I I've quickly changed my mind to um, this guy is not only is he talented, but he he can he's got some range, and uh, he he really like I was already impressed with him in part one. He he blew me away in in part two with his uh, Paul Atreides. Yeah, well, you, you, that's where we, you and I definitely di differ on that one. I, I was, I was totally, totally good with him in part one and totally not good with him in part two. All right. And that's part two. And uh, now that you've reached the end of this episode, I'm happy to announce that there will be a part three. Uh, this interview went on for about uh, two hours and 45, maybe 50 minutes. So the last half will be uh, close to. 45, 50 minutes long, uh, and we'll conclude my conversation with Steve Baker on The Rise of Dune. So expect that either next week or the week after. If if news picks up next week, I will definitely be doing a new episode on whatever comes out that week. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you like this episode, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel or subscribe to my podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, particularly Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review if you like the podcast. Of course, if you're subscribed to this channel, that is the best way to stay informed on what I'm doing on a regular basis and stay up to date on new episodes, uh, my filmmaking work, and potential uh, YouTube essays, video essays coming out very soon. All right, I hope you guys have a great day. We'll see you next time. God bless and peace out.